Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded presentations by senior U.S. intelligence officers who have great stories to tell. Today, we've got uh, a fascinating topic and a great presenter. He holds the Harold Brown Chair and is the Director of Transnational uh, Issues at CSIS. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins and the U.S. Um, Naval Graduate School. Most important for today's topic, uh, he has a great book called A Covert Action. Please welcome Seth Jones. Seth, welcome to AFIO Now. It's great to be on. Thanks for having me. What I'd like to do is uh, walk through um, the uh, early stages and then the broader implications of the CIA's covert action program in Poland during the Cold War. So let me start by sharing my slides. And then I want to end with uh, briefly what the implications are for dealing with the Russians today. So the way I'm going to proceed is we're going to look at Soviet active measures. Then we're going to look at uh, Poland and the beginning of the Reagan administration and the cracks as solidarity starts to form in 1980 in Poland. Then we'll look at the Reagan administration's response to martial law and the pressure solidarity was under in Poland and the establishment of a covert action program. And then we'll end with current implications. So as a reminder, the scene here is, is around uh, 1980 and the Cold War is in full swing. Europe is divided into two halves uh, in a bipolar system with the Soviets on one side and Poland included in the Warsaw Pact in the U.S. and NATO countries on the other. Of course, this competition exists throughout the globe. And what's important is in a, a, a critical part of Soviet activity comes through the KGB, uh, what the KGB calls active measures. And active measures were designed really at their core to conduct activities in ways that would undermine their main enemy, the United States, and its partners, including the relationship between uh, the United States and its NATO partners, and also uh, activities that would benefit Moscow and its uh, communist Marxist-Leninist interests overseas uh, during this time period. So active measures, including a couple of different uh, types of activities, the establishment of front groups to funnel money to political parties, uh, non-governmental organizations, including examples like the nuclear freeze movement in the United States, uh, the covert broadcasting of radio and other programs, including in the 1980s television programs, the orchestration of information and in particular mis- and disinformation, not unlike in some ways today, and then the use of assassinations uh, and broader intimidation against Soviet defectors, political opponents, and others. So none of this was new in a sense, but I think as, as CIA Director William Casey, uh, uh, Reagan's CIA director, uh, his initial CIA director said, most of these activities, they're not new. Many of them were employed by Lenin and Stalin and by others throughout history. And this is where this becomes important, though, because uh, Casey says, at no time in this century, however, have these techniques been used with more effect or sophistication than by the current Soviet state. So this is a declassified U.S. government overview of both overt and covert activities. On the right side of the screen, we, we see examples of overt activity, uh, propaganda through Soviet um, uh, mainstream news outlets like TASS, the official uh, sponsorship of conferences, economic aid, military assistance. And on the left side, we see covert action and, and the important aspects of active measures, forgeries, the placement of articles, the funding of political groups. And when Reagan comes into office uh, or, or wins election in 1980, the KGB is in full swing in undermining the U.S. across the board. Here are a couple of examples. As a refresher, 
On the left side of the screen, we've got an example of an advertisement placed in newspapers and magazines. No to new U.S. missiles in Europe. It was designed to um, uh, to get support and sympathy from the nuclear freeze movement and kind of the, the left and, and liberals in Western Europe and the United States, uh, but particularly to the, uh, the increase in the use of missiles in, in Western Europe. On the right side of the screen is probably the most successful KGB disinformation campaign of the Cold War, certainly one of the most successful, and that is um, labeling AIDS as a product of uh, U.S. laboratory experiments at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, of course, the whole thing was a fabrication, but a sophisticated KGB disinformation program actually influenced uh, the views of significant portions of populations in Africa and even in the United States by the mid to late 1980s. Uh, so successful in many ways in getting people to believe this conspiracy theory, and that's all it was, that the United States was behind uh, the manufacturing of, of, of the AIDS virus. And we, we actually have seen kind of the modern version of that with Chinese, Iranian, and Russian uh, uh, similar arguments about the coronavirus coming from the United States, including from military labs. We also see attempts by the KGB to undermine U.S. elections including elections in uh, 1980, 84, and even 88. And these are some declassified examples of National Security Council and FBI overviews of uh, KGB disinformation, and even in some cases, uh, the use of forgeries uh, to try to influence U.S. election outcomes. So let's, let's go to, to 1980. It's important for at least two major reasons. The first is we start to see cracks in Poland. Now, uh, in the previous 10 years before August 1980, there was a the beginnings of an opposition movement um, that what would uh, become solidarity. Uh, it it actually was uh, uh, alive and well in the 19 in the 19 late 1960s, early 1970s, and then by August 1980, particularly at locations like the Gdansk shipyard, which was, you know, a key blue collar hub of activity. Um, it's where uh, a number of Polish workers, including the electrician Lech Wałęsa on the right side of the screen, uh, were involved in uh, building ships. It was also uh, there in Gdansk where uh, Solidarity began to form as an independent, self-governing trade union. And in August of 1980, faced with uh, demonstrations in, in uh, the Gdansk shipyard, as well as other locations in Poland, Lech Wałęsa and others that became members of Solidarity get the Polish government to agree to acknowledge and legalize, in a sense, uh, trade unions. Now, um, from a, a U.S. standpoint, this begins to look like the beginnings of democratic and free political movement, and it looks the same to the Soviets. So as we'll see in a moment, there is growing concern. Around the same time, we have uh, the U.S. presidential elections in, in, and that, uh, that elect Ronald Reagan, who in part runs on a very hawkish foreign policy, where he promises uh, to compete globally with the Soviet Union and step up efforts uh, from his predecessor, Jimmy Carter. Uh, we also have a CIA director that is appointed, Bill Casey, who takes his experience in the OSS and really uh, pushes the envelope on uh, the introduction of and the expansion of covert action programs. So we have these two big fundamental changes occurring in 1980 with a major crack forming in Poland in Soviet influenced territory, as well as uh, a uh, hawkish US president who's committed to trying covert action programs uh, and being more aggressive uh, than his predecessor in the use of uh, CIA covert action. 
So as things began to uh, move into 1981, not surprising, CIA starts to predict uh, that Soviet concerns about solidarity um, start to transform into possible plans for either a Soviet invasion or to pressure uh, the Polish leader Yaroszelski to crack down himself. There are clear concerns within Moscow about, about how Poles would respond to a combination of Red Army and Warsaw Pact forces, particularly uh, how individuals, electricians and other blue collar workers in mines and shipyards are potentially going to respond an uprising against foreign forces. Um, and so the Soviets get Yaroszelski uh, to declare martial law in December of 1981. So what does martial law include? Uh, members of Solidarity are arrested. Some are tortured. Lech Wałęsa himself is captured. And we can see on the right side of the screen examples of detention centers uh, across the board for members of Solidarity, including for very important, uh, important people or VIPs, as well as the places of Lech Wałęsa's uh, detention himself. So as we move into 1982, the Reagan administration has to make a decision on what is it, what's it going to do, if anything, uh, to support the Polish people. Um, as Reagan, Casey, and other U.S. leaders look at Poland, it's very clear, even in 1982, uh, that there is a an underground movement that is barely surviving in Poland. So we have examples here. Uh, these are my photographs of a recreation of uh, Polish underground where newspapers were printed uh, where there were duplicator machines, uh, Xerox machines in a, in a, a slightly um, outdated form. You can see reams of paper. Uh, this, is, this is an example of what a clandestine uh, publication shop looked like. And, and there on the right side of the screen is an example of one of the papers that, uh, that Solidarity published. So there is an, an underground information campaign that is going on despite martial law. And what it desperately needs is money and the materials used to run an underground campaign. So it doesn't need weapons. It needs money for duplicator machine, reams of paper, ink, and those kinds of, of material. So this then leads to a debate over the course of 1982 about what to do. And what's important, I think, to recognize is as the administration debates national security more broadly, um, we see in National Security Decision Directives 32 and 54 that the Reagan National Security Council debates and then approves that they push up information operations essentially to a parallel in instrument of American power just as important as economic activities, the use of conventional military force diplomacy, uh, that information operations, covert action are important instruments of competing. So it's not just preparing for a battle with the Soviets that could lead to conventional or nuclear war. There is a battle of ideas between political and economic systems, between democracy and capitalism on one hand, and between um, Marxism, Leninism on the other. And Reagan recognizes the importance of this kind of war of ideas. So what he approves in the fall of 1982 is a covert action program that went by the cryptonym QR Helpful to aid solidarity. Now, what's important, I think, in understanding how QR Helpful was, was put together, it was never intended as a covert action program designed to overthrow the Yaroszelski regime. It's, it was not particularly ambitious. It was very moderate. It was to provide some money and as part of that non-lethal equipment, uh, to moderate Polish opposition groups, among the most important was solidarity. The decision was made for fairly straightforward reasons that it was not CIA case officers that were going to work directly with members of solidarity. 
but they were going to work through surrogates that were recruited and generally already had um, black market smuggling routes that brought material into Poland. Um, and the goals were very limited. Again, it was to aid the organizational activities of groups like Solidarity to improve, improve their ability to communicate with um, both the population in Poland, which was uh, which only had access to state-dominated and Soviet, essentially, propaganda, as well as to communicate with populations outside of Poland, and also to begin to exert additional pressure on Jaruzelski to start to ease his repressive measures uh, inside of Poland. So really, uh, in a brilliant fashion, and it brilliant in part because uh, the CIA was never identified, uh, though the Soviets and the Poles and other Warsaw Pact intelligence services suspected a CIA hand. Um, Cure Helpful included a range of different rat lines that brought material into Poland. And as we can see with the map here, those rat lines were a combination of both land routes that went from countries like France, uh, West Germany, and Belgium into East Germany, into Czechoslovakia, and then into Poland. There were also maritime routes that left countries like Belgium and the Netherlands and went up through Norway or Sweden, and then came through the Baltic Sea into uh, areas like Gdansk and Gdynia, and then made their way deeper into Poland. So what we see here is a the successful recruitment of individuals that were already bringing material into, into Poland. I think that's what made this particularly notable, is that there were a range of legal goods that could be brought from Western Euro European countries into Poland and other Warsaw Pact countries. And in those, in those trucks or in those boats would often be false compartments, uh, might often be boxes that, that or, or cans that were labeled soup, but instead had ink inside of them. They were designed to provide uh, critical material for the underground to uh, run its day-to-day -day operations. Now, there, there were some books that provided a little bit of context on QR Helpful that came out right at the end of the Cold War. They were generally wrong in the amount of money. They were wrong in relations between the CIA and the Catholic Church, as I'll get to in a moment. And they were even wrong on where the, the locus of operations for CIA activity were. They were not in, in places like Warsaw, far too dangerous for the CIA to operate in any meaningful way. It was just too much coverage from Polish and KGB intelligence. Even places like the Solidarity Office in Brussels were heavily penetrated by um, the KGB. So instead, uh, CIA leveraged uh, offices in places like its, uh, its stations in places like Paris, which already had a robust uh, Polish uh, diaspora population that lived in and around the suburbs of Paris. So uh, case officers met with a range of their uh, assets in, in, in and around cities like Paris, would provide money, which was really the glue that, um, that uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the primary element that Solidarity needed, they could use that cash uh, to then buy the materials that they needed, which we'll, we'll see in a moment. So we see stations like um, and, and CIA offices based out of West Berlin, London, uh, Rome, and other places that were used to meet assets and get money to them. And even as far away as places like Mexico City, places like that, we would see uh, demonstrations against the Jaruzelski regime uh, with uh, some organizational assistance uh, from, from the CIA and, and case officers. There were demonstrations on the um, uh, subway in Paris that, uh, and leaflets that were uh, pushed out uh, and poster board with, with help from, from CIA. So, I mean, in, in general, uh, there were a lot of things going on from broader information support to solidarity all the way to uh, the material that was used. Uh, here's an example of what Polish and uh, Soviet uh, 
efforts attempted to seize. And this is actually examples of what they seized over the course of the 1980s. We, we get this from uh, the declassified uh, Polish intelligence service. They, uh, they seized leaflets, posters, copies of journals and books, offset presses, Xerox machines, duplicators, uh, silkscreen frames, typewriters, and reams of paper. These are all very important to the Solidarity Underground and give us an example of, of what CIA and other entities were pushing into, into Poland. And this did mark a, the, the amount of money, resources, time and general effort that KGB, uh, Polish SB, and broader law enforcement intelligence agencies put to trying to stop this material from coming in was extraordinary. And they failed, as they noted in declassified memos, they, they failed because that funding continued, the material continued to get uh, from the West into, into the Polish uh, solidarity underground over the course of, uh, of the 1980s. There was an important element also of the Catholic Church. Now, there have been, there's been some myth about the strategic and even tactical level cooperation between CIA and the Catholic Church as part of the QR Helpful Program. Um, what I can say based on my conversations, interviews, and review of declassified documents is that there certainly were uh, that there was that there were numerous discussions between senior Catholic Church officials, including the Pope, who was who was Polish, John Paul II, and, and Ronald Reagan, um, the uh, CIA director Casey, and other senior U.S. officials. They both recognized the importance of aiding solidarity. They both recognized the importance that this was much more than a conventional or nuclear struggle with the Soviets. It was also an important informational struggle. But QR Helpful was largely a CIA program. Where the Catholic Church was helpful is in the legitimacy that the Pope brought to the Solidarity Movement. This is his visit actually to Lech Wałęsa's location. Uh, uh, he lived in this uh, a broader apartment complex in Gdansk. I've, I've visited and seen this, this area. The Pope visits and gives enormous legitimacy to solidarity. Catholic churches, including St. Bridget's in Gdansk, were used by solidarity members to meet. Um, some priests were certainly helpful in providing material, including ink, cartridges, duplicator machines, paper, to the solidarity underground. So, so key elements of the Catholic Church were certainly helpful and really operated as a um, separate, though supplemental uh, assistance effort to uh, CIA and other activity. There, were, there was activity going on from labor unions, including the AFL, CIO, uh, and governments um, across the, the globe providing uh, some assistance to solidarity. By 1989, uh, there had been a significant increase in overt assistance to solidarity, and there were elections that uh, Yaroslavsky agrees uh, to happen in in Poland. Now, um, what's what's a little uh, comical in one sense is on the right side we see a picture of um, a solidarity poster, and we have uh, a uh, uh, picture of a uh, of an individual here carrying. What was a what was a, a six shooter and is is now this is this is high this is high noon what what has been transitioned into a ballot there were concerns that um, having uh, a, a Gary Cooper hold a six shooter for a CIA program that was non it was peaceful at its core would send the wrong message so uh, CIA lawyers had Gary Cooper or had, uh, had to, the individuals that helped create the poster changed the six shooter uh, to a ballot. And that was much more in line, actually, with where Poland was anyway by 1989. So uh, Lech Wałęsa uh, and Solidarity are enormously successful in the, no in the November 1989 elections, or in the, in the 1989 elections. Lech Wałęsa in November visits the U.S. Congress and is greeted by both Democrats and Republicans as a hero. And as we know now, communism starts to collapse. 
in the fall of 1989, and by 1990, Lech Wałęsa is elected president. So we have this extraordinary development over the course of 1980s that solidarity goes from a an, a budding opposition movement to being nearly crushed by martial law uh, to then winning uh, winning in 1990 uh, the presidential elections and having its leader become the leader of Poland. It's ex- an extraordinary development. But I think it's worth asking what what role did CIA have in that in that um, uh, in that evolution? And I would say a couple of things. One is very important. Uh, to note that the 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 day to day work and the the credit is largely due and it should be given to members of solidarity like Fuenza and others uh, that did the uh, the the brunt you know the the brunt of the work in building solidarity running the opposition movement and then in getting uh, Lech Fuenza elected in in 1990. But I think where CIA is helpful is in the early part of the 1980s, there's very little outside assistance coming to solidarity from outside, a little bit from labor unions and some foreign governments. But as I put together the amounts of money that were given to solidarity, CIA appears to be the largest outside uh, funder, at least in the 1983, 1984, 1985 period. And again, wasn't providing arms, weapons, lethal material. It was providing uh, political, the means to run a political and an information underground. So I would say what that tells me more broadly is that CIA assistance was critical, particularly early on. By the end of the 1980s, there's a lot of outside overt funding coming from the U.S., from the National Endowment for Democracy and other sources that really help get solidarity over the edge uh, and 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 to become the really the main opposition and then the uh, the, the incumbent within uh, within Poland. Um, as we look to today, and I'll just really highlight a couple of things. A lot has changed, but the Russians are still involved in uh, a range of activities: misinformation, disinformation, much like the KGB was involved in in the uh, 1960s, 70s, and even the 1980s that we just looked at. Uh, the intelligence agencies have changed a little bit. So from KGB, we now go to the GRU, FSB, and SBR, which are primarily involved in the offensive cyber operations, espionage, and the modern day version of active measures that the Russians are conducting, including the disinformation that's happening on U.S. platforms and activity regarding the 2016 and even the 2020 elections. We also saw active measures involved in uh, COVID-19, along with the Chinese and the Iranians, labeling COVID-19 as uh, being produced, uh, obviously falsely, by uh, labs like the one in Fort Detrick, Maryland, which are very reminiscent of what we saw the KGB do with the AIDS program in the 1980s. Um, I think what's missing, and then we can perhaps get to this in the, Q, in the Q&A, is, uh, is real thoughtfulness about uh, how to conduct an offensive program is the U.S. was successful at this during the Cold War. It had to take risks, as we saw with both Reagan and Casey. There were problems, as the U.S. ran into in the um, Iran-Contra episode, as well as in Latin America. But at the end of the day, I think uh, covert action programs like QR Helpful were extremely success, successful in helping undermine uh, the Soviet Union and the uh, Soviet power and influence globally, including, in this case, in Poland, in Eastern Europe. So with that, I will turn it back. Seth, what a fascinating story. Very well told today and also uh, captured in your great book. Um, on behalf of the viewers, what led you to this particular topic? How did you find your way to this particular COVID action program? Well, I, I think, you know, like, like with any book that I've written, it's always helpful for me to, to try to find new, new areas, uh, things that haven't been covered much. And I had spent a lot of time on counterterrorism and special operations activity. I had worked 
uh, as a civilian in U.S. special operation and had worked with CIA overseas, including with folks both from the, uh, the uh, analytical as well as the operational side. One thing that in looking at potential topics, uh, especially as Russian disinformation uh, had become a major theme in, inside of the U.S., was that there were successful programs that the U.S. had conducted during the Cold War, and there was not a lot known about them. And the Polish one was an example of that. There's a little bit that I had found in one of Robert Gates's books uh, and in a few other places, but not a lot of details. And uh, so I, I felt it was really important to dig a little bit to see if how much was available in uh, in the Reagan archives is the first place I went to. So really, it was it was trying to hit a topic of interest, Russian activity and a U.S. response, which was, uh, we, you know, which had some direct implications to what the U.S. was struggling with at the time I wrote the book. And then a program that had not really had much public acknowledgement of it. That was the motivation. Seth, how much uh, encouragement or discouragement did you get in this project? How helpful did you find people um, or how unhelpful? Well, I, I made the decision early on that I, I really wasn't going to reach out to, to many people to, uh, to talk. Um, and I decided that I was going to start with the Reagan archives to see what was there. Um, there wasn't a lot of what I would call tactical level information, but there was a lot of strategic information available about the importance of covert action. Uh, There's a, a lot available about uh, uh, CIA assessments of the Soviet invasion, CIA assessments that had been declassified over the course of the 1980s. And then in the secondary literature, uh, there was some information about the uh, CIA program. So I, after getting a reasonable picture of what was available from uh, the Reagan archives, then I went to talk to what I would call sort of non-CIA personnel, folks that were at the uh, National Security Council that would have been uh, involved in the program, at, at the very least in, in supporting its approval and the, the finding that went with it, people like uh, Richard Pipes, uh, people like Ed Meese, uh, people like uh, Vice President George H.W. Uh, Bush, uh, several of whom have uh, passed away since I spoke to them. And, and all, were, all of these individuals were willing to talk, broadly speaking, about QR Helpful and about, um, about various uh, parts of the discussion that led to the, the 1982 finding, and at least their thoughts about where it fit into broader uh, U.S. Uh, efforts against the Soviet Union. And then at that point then, after talking to a range of um, uh, Department of Defense, NSC, uh, State Department officials, seeing a lot of the primary and secondary sources, I then went to uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. And I would say, um, you know, I, I wasn't asking for much support there, uh, but I was uh, uh, providing the information that I had and letting them know that I was writing the book. Uh, and, you know, whether they liked it or not, there's a lot of information out there. So I would say I, I got, I definitely got support. I didn't really get any closed doors. Uh, I got some support. And I provided the manuscript uh, to the CIA when it was done. People did provide a number of comments, which were actually quite helpful. So, I mean, I think in that sense, uh, there were a number of corrections that I made uh, and what would have been unforced errors uh, had, had there not been some uh, cooperation. And then, and then uh, among the most helpful individuals as I was wrapping up was um, since uh, Bill Casey uh, had long since passed away. Uh, I I got cooperation, and actually, um, uh, he agreed to write a blurb on the back of the book from uh, Bill Webster, who replaced Casey as the CIA director. So uh, Webster was very helpful, willing to talk, and then actually willing to uh, to write a blurb about how important the program was uh, in competition uh, with the Soviets. So I think, in that sense, there there was 
there was certainly some helpful uh, support from from CIA officials. Seth, as you point out at the end of your presentation, there are some real implications for today. But as we all know, information dissemination and information technology of 1980 cannot be compared to uh, 2020. Um, it's a much smaller world. Things move a lot more quickly and uh, automatically. Um, you want to comment a little bit on your views of the difficulties of conducting this kind of a covert action in today's world? Sure. Uh, I am not a case officer. I do not do uh, or run covert action. So I would defer. Uh, I, I would defer about the intricacies of some of that to uh, an expert, um, uh, not myself. But what I would say in looking at a program like this and being involved, at least on the military side of special operations, is uh, that, you know, it's, it is much more difficult to run uh, covert or even clandestine programs with social media. There's so much more awareness of people, especially if at some point in their lives they, they have a digital uh, signature, their faces identities, activity have come up, whether they were in college or in um, in high school or in their earlier profession before they went to CIA. So, I, I mean, I think in that sense, there, it's much harder to run one. At the same time, I think uh, there there is, whether it's a covert action program or not, I think there still is a very important component in U.S. foreign policy for offensive information programs. And I would just highlight that among the U.S.'s most significant adversaries, the Chinese, the Iranians, and the and the Russians, all have uh, have internets in their countries that that are a state-run, all of state-run uh, media's. You know, in, in in Iran, they call it the uh, halal net. In China, it's the Great Firewall, and they limit or try to limit the amount of information, certainly coming from outside. To their respective populations. Well, this opens up a, or should open up a lot of avenues for thinking about how does one get information in this age to populations that are being repressed, whether it's in Xinjiang, China, whether it's in Hong Kong, uh, whether it's in Belarus or even in Russia and Iran itself. How does how do we get information? It doesn't have to be a covert action program per se, but I think it does require thinking very systematically about what options are available and what the U.S. should do and what risks it should take. Seth, I know you're working on uh, several other projects as we speak. Um, would you like to give our viewers uh, a little sneak preview of some things that might be coming in the future that we could um, have as the focus of a future presentation? Sure. I mean, probably the most interesting is a book that uh, is coming out in 2021. And it looks at, it, it doesn't look at the US, it looks at how the Russians, the Chinese, and the Iranians are competing with the United States. And the argument is essentially that while the US is largely preparing for conventional and nuclear war with these countries, and think for a moment about how much the US spends on uh, major aircraft and and platforms and systems, including aircraft carriers, to fight the Chinese in the Taiwan's, you know, in the Taiwan Straits or the South China Sea or the Russians in the Baltics. Yet on a day to day basis, uh, competition from Tehran, Moscow, and Beijing is largely irregular. It's not conventional, and it's not nuclear. It is finding ways to expand their power and influence and undermine the United States through cyber operations, through disinformation and misinformation, through special operations and intelligence forces, including private military companies, through espionage activities, and through even overt programs like Confucius Institutes and the Thousand Talents programs that the Chinese have as well as in 5G networks and other, other activities like that. So, so what I'm looking at is what, what does that mean based on what these countries are doing? What does that mean? Why are, why are we not competing at that level? And what do we need to do to compete more effectively in the future? Sounds like a great next issue. <laughs>
Yeah, it's been a fabulous presentation. Thank you, Seth. I want to thank you. I'd like to thank uh, CSIS for making you available. And we look forward to having you back on very soon.